Amen. He deserves all the praise. Our next uh, song will be Cornerstone. Here's our cornerstone. And I'm going to invite you to stand up with us and sing this last worship song with us. If you can, please all stand with us.
Dear Father, we're so grateful for this beautiful Sabbath day. We've had an interesting week and you've helped us get through every bit of it. And now we're just so glad to meet with you and we want to hear your voice like we do every day and then times 10, Lord, on this holy time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. good morning. It's a delight to be here. Amen. We don't have as many people here, but thank the Lord for us. Amen. Uh, on yesterday, uh, I, I got a call from, from Brother Yolanda, Yamada, I'm sorry, Brother Yamada, and he was just sharing about how he went, went to uh, Washington, D.C. to uh, on a, a trip, and he told me to share with you because he caught a cold over there, he said, with 30 degrees. Wow. And you know, if it's sort of cold here, but not like that, but uh, we just thank, thank the Lord that he made it back safely and he got sick and he asked that you would pray for him. And pray for him and, and uh, that uh, everything will be okay. But anyway, he'll, he will share the trip with you when he come. Uh, on tomorrow, there will be a, a spring thing did I say it right? Spring fling at the academy tomorrow from 10 to 3 o'clock, I think, I think it says. 
So do anyone have any prayer requests? Uh, who can kneel? Please kneel at this time. Our dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can come to you in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the rain, and dear Lord, we made it through the storms, and we just thank you again for your love and protection towards us. <coughs> Be with uh, Elder Yamada as he uh, went through his uh, colds and, and things that he got uh, as he was on his trip. And dear Lord, we pray uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, individuals are traveling, so we pray for those who are out there. And dear Lord, we all have some needs. You saw the hands that went up, and you know every need uh, that we have, and we, we ask that you will continue to bless us and bless this service today, dear Lord. Be with Pastor Dale as he lead out, and thank you for his wife as she played the beautiful music also. So bless this church, bless us and keep us, and help us, dear Lord, that we continue to hold on to your unchanging hand. This is our prayer and our hope. In the blessed name of Jesus Christ, let us all say amen, amen and amen. amen. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> Today's offering call is for the local church budget. Years ago, a mentor of mine encouraged me to take my relationship with God as seriously as I take my career. She saw, as, she saw me as a very driven person, but she instructed me to make sure I connected with God at the beginning of every day. That began my habit of waking up before the sun rises around 5 a.m. to spend quiet time reading God's word and reflecting on it through prayer. A little bit ago, my husband and I noticed our daughter taking out her Bible in the morning before getting ready for school. She found a corner in our living room to pray. When my husband asked her why she was up so early, she said, Mommy gets up early to speak to Jesus and I want to be like mommy, develops a deep personal collect connection with Jesus. Whether this is your first time at church, spiritual journey with God, you can learn from. Today's offering goes to our local church budget in order to keep our church ministries functioning. We depend on the generosity of members returning that faithful offering to support our local church. Will the deacon and deaconess please stand? <clears throat> for you please accept our tithes and offerings bless and multiply them for the furthering of your work in Jesus name I pray amen, amen.
Do we have any young people here? Please come forward. We have, uh, we have our dynamic duo here. And they, they, uh, Yolanda will present the uh, children's story. And after that, the team will sing for us in, in the play. So we appreciate both of you guys. Well, I was standing watching her. She was old. I came to see her. She was in a wheelchair. There you go. I'll make space for you up here. She was in a wheelchair. And she was not pretty. And I thought, why do people like her so much? Everybody wanted to talk to her. So we were in line. And there were people ahead of me, and I watched. <clears throat> and you know what? She was so sweet. She had the sweetest look on her face. And I thought, what a nice looking person. Why do people want to see her so much? And pretty soon, it was my turn. And she said, well, I don't know you, dear. What's your name? And I felt so special. And she said, sit down by me. Let's get acquainted. And she made everybody wait while she talked to just me. And I thought, I wonder why she's in a wheelchair. But I didn't say anything, because I was afraid it'd embarrass her. And she says, well, honey, this wheelchair is not my favorite thing to sit in. But I must sit in because I'm sick. And I felt so sorry for her, but she says, I'm not sad. I could tell that. She was a happy lady. And everybody wanted to be with her. And so I said, what's your secret, lady? You're so happy, and yet you're sitting in a wheelchair. And she said, every morning I wake up and I say, Jesus, come into my heart. And she said, all of a sudden, I become very happy. And you know what? People like being around happy people. You notice that? They like to be around happy people. They like to be around people that, that make them feel special. So today, you're going to get to make someone feel special. All right. So first of all, I'm going to make you feel special. Because I have a present for you. First, I'm going to give you a present. And then you are going to give everybody here a present. Can you do that for me? And you're going to say, I love you. OK? Can you do that? You can't do that? Pick somebody you can do it for. This one's for you. I love you. And this is 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 for you. I love you. Now, who wants to be the boss? I need two bosses. OK, I'll make you the boss. And you're going to be the boss of this bag. And you're going to take one person with you. And the two of you are going to give something that's in here to every person here. And can you be the boss of this bag? OK, so you're going to take another person with you, one of these people here. Well, two. Can you take two? All right. So there are presents in here for everybody here. And you, what are you going to say to them? I love you. OK? This is your bag. Oops, sorry. OK, go do your job. Who's, who are you going to take with you? You have to take somebody with you. Take somebody with you. Can you go with her and help her? She needs help. You can't. OK. My he should. Can you go help her? OK, go help her. Yeah. 
Oh, that's my glasses. You can't have those. <laughs> you can give him something else. <laughs> They say light adjustable lenses because I just had surgery and I have to wear these when I go out. <laughs> Sorry.
Today's scripture is from Acts 17, 30, and 31. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Wherefore, he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. this time. Good, well, how are you doing? Good. You look good. Of course, we don't know about those who aren't here. They may be deathly ill, huh? We don't know. Yeah, we miss them, don't we? We wish they were all here. But you know, you've got a great group. Yeah, I remember when this was a good group. Right? Do you remember that? Yeah, well, this, this would be a good group because we sometimes had smaller groups. Well, it's wonderful to see you. Well, my title is Three Years with Jesus, so you probably think I'm going to tell you about the disciples. And I kind of am. Oh, yeah, my wife doesn't want me to preach her this thing on. I wore this to protect you, not to protect me. These things don't protect the wearer, you know. Huh? They don't protect the wearer, no. But they slightly protect everybody else from the wearer because I got a cold. You, know, you want to know who gave it to me? No, I'm not going to tell you. You can just guess. You just have to guess. I didn't make any charges. I didn't make any. But it's such a nasty one that I don't want anybody else to get it. Man, it's really something else. All right, so there were 12 apostles. One of them was a bad guy. He went off his own way. The, the disciples decided to choose another one. I don't know how that went. I don't know anything about what his ministry was afterwards, but he had been one of the guys who had been with Jesus a lot during those three years, three and a half years. And um, turns out, though, that God had a choice of his own, doesn't it? Another fellow came along, and he started really persecuting the church. Young church, young believers, families, children, parents. It was a terrible thing. And he was, a, he was a powerful young man. He was a leader. He had tremendous stamp out this Christian uprising. This, this was a false thing that was going to destroy Judaism. <coughs> so in, in Galatians 1, he tells us about his experience, this guy named Saul, who became what? Paul. He became Paul, right. He says in verse 11, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. So by the time he wrote Galatians, he'd been preaching the truth for quite a while. How did that, or was I taught it? Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus. He was such a terrible persecutor, right from Jesus Christ. But how could that be? Jesus was gone. Well, let's go on reading. Verse 13, for you have heard, I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. When God called me and gave me a new, a new direction. You remember the story, don't you? He heard the voice from heaven and it said, 
Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus, and you're persecuting me. Yeah, such a beautiful story. So he decided to follow Jesus, but he said, my first inclination after I became a follower of Jesus was not to go and talk to Jesus' already apostles. What? I think my first inclination would have been to go and talk to the apostles. I would have wanted to talk to John and even doubting Thomas and Peter. I would have wanted to talk to them. He didn't do that. Why not? He says, I did not. Verse 17, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia. Now that just seems like the last place you would go. What's in Arabia? Camels? I don't think they'd give us too much gospel, enlightenment, maybe a little bit. Sand? Yeah, the Nabataean kingdom was in Arabia at that time. Anybody know anything about the Nabataeans? No? Anybody ever heard of the city of Petra? Called Petra because it's made out of stone, and that's the old Latin word for stone, right? It's all made out of, a, it's carved out of the rocks itself, right out, right into the stone facade of the, of the desert. And uh, the Nabataeans were ruling the whole area which at that day and age was called Arabia. They weren't Christians, they weren't Jews, they weren't, they were just pagans. They were still offering human sacrifices on the tops of the mountain. So we don't have any reason to think he particularly spent a lot of time with them. It's just that he went to that remote desert area, see, because any area that wasn't kind of tamed was like it is now. And there was, there was just a, a lot of empty space. So why did he go to Arabia? He says, later I returned to Damascus. Now, Damascus is where he was originally to meet Jesus and decide to be a Christian. Finally, he says in verse 18, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas. Who's Cephas? Yeah, that's another name for Peter. And he, he wanted to meet Peter, finally, after three years. So what was he doing for those three years? Well, he was doing the most important thing any person can ever do. He was getting acquainted with Jesus. Why do you think the first 12 apostles were so converted and became so effective and got filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and ended up going all over the world starting Christianity? It was because they spent three years with Jesus. That changed them. But now we have another apostle called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. By the way, I'm sure thankful that we got an apostle for the Gentiles. Because I'm a Gentile. Got any other Gentiles around here? Yeah. You know, the Jews in those days didn't have much use for the Gentiles. I'm still not sure if they still do. They used to call them goy. Like they still call them goy. It's short for going, but it means mud people. Yeah, we were just the dirt. Because God had called them and chosen them to be the people. The kingdom of the world belonged to them. There are still many conservative Jews who have the same view. The world belongs to them. And they know it, and God's going to give it to them, and, and it's all going to be, they're going to be in charge. So we'll see how that goes. Anyway, they didn't understand the kingdom of God at all, did they? And Pete, Paul was one of those. He was one of those. One of those radical Jews who just thought they had the right to be in charge of everything. So, sad, very sad. And, and he says, so I finally, he says, I went to Peter. Now this was after his conversion. And I stayed with him for 15 days. Well, that's just barely a decent vacation. 
15 days, that's not a very long time to get educated, is it? But he wanted to know everything Jesus, everything Peter knew about Jesus. But he did not. Now get this. Even though Peter was a chosen apostle, he did not want to be influenced by Peter. What do you think about that? I'm going to tell you something right now. The only influence I want to have on you is I don't want you to be influenced by, you know, my general thinking. I want to have the influence on you of leading you to spend time with Jesus. I want Jesus to be the influence in your life. I don't want to tell you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. I want Jesus to tell you that. I don't want to tell you how to be a good person. I want Jesus to give that to you. You hear me? There is no other power in heaven and earth. Jesus has it all. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. There's not, Jesus has it all. So you don't need me to explain to you how to be a better person except to say this. Spend time with Jesus. So Paul had just come from spending time with Jesus. Now, what kind of time did he spend with Jesus? Same kind I can spend? Exactly the same? Like, you know, he just read his Bible and he just, you know, meditated? Because he hadn't spent those other three years with Jesus, there wasn't much he could find out about Jesus. Think about it. The story of Jesus was actually written by one of Jesus. Mark might have been written already by that time. John wouldn't be written for another 40 years or 50 years later. Matthew was probably not written yet either. <coughs> Remember, this is only... Now five, six years after Jesus has gone back to heaven. So how is he going to get to know Jesus? Well, he explains it. 2 Corinthians 12, 5. I will reluctantly tell you about visions and revelations from the Lord. Now, this is a very modern translation, but if you compare it with your King James, you'll see it's a good translation. This is exactly what the King James says, but it's in, this is in modern, modern English. It says, I'll reluctantly tell you about visions and revelations from the Lord. Now, in the King James, it records it exactly from the Greek, where he says, I knew a man. But then he goes on explaining that it's actually himself, but he doesn't want to brag. Are you with me? So this, king, this modern version just leaves that out and just says, I. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Now he's writing this 14 years later after he's, you know, had those three years after he's seen Peter. He's writing this 14 years later. He says, I was taken up to the third heaven. Now, we know... The Bible doesn't define what the third heaven is, but it, there are three layers out there. There's the one that you and I see, and the airplanes fly in, the birds fly in, and all that. That's where our weather is, right? Our wonderful let weather. Clouds, lightning strikes, and tornadoes. That's in the first heaven. All right. The second heaven is the sky. It's above that. It's all that stuff we call space. It's just full of stars. But that's not where he was taken to. By the way, that second heaven is pretty inhospitable. Would you agree? You better be dressed up pretty fine to go out there. You better have a totally self-contained suit that will keep you going. Because you're going to just, it's, it's, there's not even any, any atmospheric pressure there, right? So your body rapidly expands. Like explosively. When you get out there. Think of that. Ew. Anyway, so he says, I will reluctantly, because he's humble. He doesn't want to brag. He says, I'll reluctantly tell you about visions and revelations from the Lord. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. 
He says, whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Feel oral that he literally couldn't tell if he was, maybe he was there in the flirt. Sounds like fun. She, 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 she realized, because her friends were observing her vision, she realized she, she didn't go there physically, but she had it. It was like being there physically. She could hear, she could see, she could talk to people, she could touch, she could, you know, the whole thing. So that, that's probably the experience he had. He says, I don't know whether I was in the body or out of my body, which tells you that he was alone because nobody else told him either. He was in Arabia. Man, if I thought I could get that effect from going to Arabia, I'd get a ticket tomorrow. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not about location. But we can tell from that passage he was alone. Because somebody would have told him, your body didn't go anywhere. Right? But they didn't tell him that. So he was alone. Yes, he says, only God knows whether I was in my body or whether I was outside of my body. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise. Now listen to this. And I heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. And then he says something even more strange than that. Things no human is allowed to tell. Whoa, what did he see? What did he hear? What did he learn? Now realize, he's getting acquainted with Jesus. But in heaven itself, he is the only apostle who spent significant time with Jesus in his resurrected life. No wonder he can tell us what the resurrection is like. Did he see? Did he see Moses? Did he talk to Elijah? I don't doubt it for a minute. The others did. Why wouldn't he? He speaks so authoritatively. Did you ever read the Apostle Paul's work? We have such a big Bible, we tend to read the whole Bible, but the Apostle Paul's work should not be skipped. It should be emphasized. Because the Apostle Paul's work, you'll see in a minute why the Apostle Paul's work is so important. Of all the 12 apostles, and I really think he, even though he was the 13th, technically I really think he was one of the 12. Of all the 12, he alone got to talk with Jesus in his glorified state. What did he learn? Well, we're going to find out some things he learned. The most important thing he learned, I want to share with that with you today. But I just, I just, I would love to know all the things he learned. It's illegal, though. What would happen if I learned it? I don't know. I might. What heaven is like? You know, he, very, he never was very big on marriage. Did you notice that? He never was very big on marriage. Now, 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 the Bible's very pro-marriage, because marriage is a good thing for morality, and of course, we need children. But he was never very big on marriage. And I realized, Jesus said, there's no marrying in heaven. And he spent those three years in heaven, or going back and forth to heaven, or whatever he did, spent a lot of time there. He noticed there wasn't any marriage in heaven. I think he was just saying, you know, might as well get used to it now. <laughs> Not going to be any marriage in heaven, might as well get used to it now. Just marry Jesus. I really feel that was, his, that was his alternative, you know what I mean? Just really give it all to Jesus. I mean, that, that's what he did, isn't it? That's what he did. He's an influence. You know, he found out that Jesus was a friend. He was still the friend of sinners, even in his glorified state. Because Paul says, I am the chief of sinners. You know, and, and, he, and in a way he was. He, he was killing the Christians. And I don't, I don't know what other weaknesses or flaws he had, but he was a normal person. He talks about that in the, in the, in the Epistle of Romans, how afflicted he was with, with, with weaknesses and, and, and fleshly temptations. He was a normal human being. And yet, 
Jesus befriended him, not on earth, but in heaven itself. What do you think about that? I mean, that's just amazing. So how authoritative is Paul's work? See, the reason he said this here is because it was a crisis in the church at that time, and Paul was going around making converts all over the Gentile world, converting our great-great-great-grandparents. Thank God he did. And, and many people were saying, well, that's Paul. See, he's not one of the true disciples. He's a come lately. Oh, they were saying that. He's a second-rate witness because he didn't actually spend three years with Jesus. Well, guess what? He actually did. That's why he speaks so, with such authority. He knows Jesus, and he knows what Jesus wants and what Jesus has to offer, and he knows everything about the gospel. And he claims rather boldly in several places. You've read it recently, haven't you, Paul's epistles? He claims rather boldly in some places, you know, 2 Corinthians in some places, that his word is with total authority, that no one dare question him, that if they go against his gospel, they're going straight to the other place. Because that's how much authority he has. He got this straight from the risen Savior. He doesn't want to brag. Paul doesn't like to brag. But you can see here, he has a right to brag. He has a reason to say, I know what I'm talking about. And here's the strange thing. Even to this day, Christians and the church do not give all the authority that he should be given. In fact, they still look down on a lot of his writings as being kind of personal and kind of impractical and kind of opinionated. No. Paul gives you the absolute straight truth. Salvation is not by the law. Salvation is by Christ. That's what Paul teaches. And that is the authoritative truth. So he says, we're not even allowed. I wouldn't even be allowed to tell you the things that I heard and saw. But of course he did. He spent the rest of his life telling what he was allowed to tell. So I love this, because this is something he tells. He tells this to the philosophers in Athens. Remember when he preached that sermon in Athens? They invited him to the most important and prestigious venue in Athens. And they said, we want to hear what you're talking about. So he was unafraid. He went there and he talked to all these great philosophers, all these men of letters who knew everything there was to know in the world in that day. And he said, let me tell you about Jesus. He came down here to show us who God is, and then he died, and then he got resurrected. And half of them said, resurrected? That's ridiculous. And they immediately dismissed him. But some of them said, we want to hear more about this resurrection. But here's something else he said. This is in Acts chapter 17. And I love this because it's just a, such a great hint. He's telling these people, he's talking to them, he says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He made everything from one man, verse 26. He made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. So you wonder why we have all these different countries. God already marked that all out ahead of time. He's, Paul says, God did this. Now, see, we wouldn't know that. Where else does it say that in the Bible? We know that because Paul found that out when he was talking to Jesus in heaven. God, I'm going to mark out. God says, I'm marking out all these nations. I'm determining where, they, where their border is, right? Let's fix that border with Mexico, yes? God already fixed it. And God already determined it. <laughs> All right. I wonder if God needs our help. Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, God did this so that they would seek him. Why did God keep his hand in things in this world? Because he wanted to keep giving people a need to seek him. Why does God let so many bad things happen in this world? He wants to give people a need to seek him. I ask you the truth. When did you seek him the most desperately? When everything was smooth 
or when there were problems. Uh, yeah, yeah. God wants you to seek him. And this is just such a beautiful thing. Though he is not far from any one of us. God is so close to every single human being. I've really learned this as a chaplain. Any person can reach out for God and find him. Just, just reach out and find him. He's right there. He's ready. Are you, are you listening? He's ready. Now he's ready. You don't have to prove that you are sincere. You don't have to take, you know, two years to get your life cleaned up. He's ready now. He's near everyone. Can you believe that? That's what Paul teaches. He's near everyone. The Jews didn't teach that. They taught that God was not even available to the Gentiles. We'll let them do our Sabbath work because they can't be saved anyway. That's what they taught. They were so mad when Paul started saying, you know, God has broken down the partition. This, this, this salvation that he's been offering the Jews is, is open to everybody. Oh, they hated that message. They just wanted to get rid of him. <clears throat> See, he talked to Jesus, and Jesus said, you know, actually, it's true that I've chosen the Jewish nation to keep up the gospel. And, you know, I've, I've chosen them to, or the, the, the law, to keep, keep the law in front of the world and, and to show that there's only one God and that he's the maker of all things. But he says, actually, I want everybody in my kingdom. I want everybody, and I'm opening up this, this invitation to everybody. And then he said this astonishing thing. It's, he actually gives us one of the laws of physics here. For in him we live and move and have our being. And he's not talking about converted Christians here. He's talking about the human race. He says, in him we live and move and have our being. This is something he had to learn when he was in heaven. See, nature seems solid to us, and we know how babies happen, and we think we have a part in our own evolution. But he says, actually, we're nothing. You know, you go down to the molecular level, right? And then you go down to the atomic level. And all of us are just made out of little bits of energy that swirl around each other. And there's just 99.9% .9 space in our bodies. I feel more solid than that. This is just energy forces resisting each other. That's all. We are made of practically nothing. There's not sure. They're trying to weigh how much a nucleus weighs. And you're made out of trillions and trillions of nuclei, but they hardly weigh anything. Put them all together, they don't weigh anything. So where'd you get this weight of yours? It's all just forces resisting each other. And your weight has to do with the reaction of gravity to your molecular structure. It's not because you're actually anything. We live in him. We literally occupy his force field. We literally are made out of his energy. He invented us and created us, as he says, as Paul says in another one of his books, out of nothing. And so here he gives us a glimpse of what he saw way ahead of all the physicists. Only in the last few decades have the physicists realized this is literally true. For in him we live, in him we move. We're just acting with, interacting with these forces, all of which are God's force himself. I'm not, I'm not a pantheist. I'm not saying that, that this building is God or this carpet or anything. No, 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 no. But just that God's forces make all of this happen. Constantly. We live in him. Not he set us here to live in a place that he created and walked off and let us be. No. We live in him moment by moment, day by day. Everybody. 
Are you close to God? Are you kidding? You're made out of God's stuff. You are close to God. And God has given you somehow, in all the interaction of these forces, he's given you a personality and a will and the power of choice. And he loves his creation. He's excited about it. Did you ever make something? I never did. I never did make anything I was that satisfied with. I never made anything and looked at it and said, now that's good. I've enjoyed the things I've made because it's fun to have some creativity, right, and put some out there. But God alone could look at what he made and said, now that's really good. All right. Well, we're getting on in time here, so I learned from Jesus. The big thing in terms of how it relates to you. Ephesians 3, 2. He says, I suppose you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for your benefit. I suppose you've heard that God chose me and gave me these special revelations to help you. Then in verse 3, he says, this is Ephesians 3, verse 3, the mystery, the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly earlier. In other words, I didn't get it from Peter. I didn't get it from James. I didn't get it from John. This mystery was revealed to me by revelation. Jesus himself taught me this. And it's related to that thing we just said. Rather, we speak God's wisdom, not human wisdom. Where did he get this God's wisdom? He got it from his time in heaven. Mysterious hidden wisdom which God predetermined before the ages for our glory and which none of the rulers of this age know. For, they, for if they had known it, they would not have crucified Jesus. Wow. They didn't know who Jesus was, did they? Can you imagine what the gall and the astonishing bravery would have been to kill the one in whom you live and move and have your being. <coughs> he says, if they had known who Jesus was, they would not have crucified him. They would have been way too scared to do that. Even as it was. Remember Pilate? He had little glimpses of who Jesus was. And he was terrified of crucifying him. He says, I'm not taking responsibility for this. Somebody bring me a dish. <laughs> <coughs> Remember? And he washed his hands. He said, no, I'm not taking any responsibility for the results of this. So, yeah. He got this, he got this mystery. He got, he got the answer to a mysterious question. And this is how he describes his revelation. He quotes it from the Old Testament as it is written. What eye has not seen and ear has not heard and what has not entered into the human heart, what God has prepared for those who love him. He says, you can't, you have not seen it, but he has. You haven't heard it, but I have. This is the mystery that he's going to tell us. This is the mystery, he says in Colossians, the first chapter, verse 26. This is the mystery which has been hidden for ages and generations, but now is revealed to his saints, to those God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. And now finally he tells us what the mystery is, which is, Christ in you. Ah, the Jews didn't understand that. They thought they kept the commandments, God would love them and bless them. They didn't know salvation was by Christ in you. They had no idea. They didn't even know Christ could get in you. 
See, that's why Paul, when he understood this physics thing and how we're just space is made by God in the first place and how God's given us this ability to interact with all these forces and have some willpower and all that, and finally he saw it. Oh! We were created to be temples of that spirit. We were created with space for the God mind inside of us. Oh, that's the mystery. Why did he love us so much? Why did he save Noah and his family when the whole world rejected God? Why did he keep the race going? Why did he allow the world to have all these difficulties and challenges and trials and tribulations? Hoping that someone would find him, would happily reach after him and would find him even though he's not far from anybody. He wanted to show them what they really were there for. Don't you know you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? Don't you know God's plan for you is that you will be indwelt, infused with, share the same space with, have the same mind of Christ. I'm quoting Paul there. Am I not? You've read enough to know that? We have the mind of Christ, he says in this gospel, in this this epistle of Colossians. So here it is, friends. This is the great mystery that Paul saw that really changes everything. Salvation is by choosing to be occupied by the heart and mind of Jesus. Now, what does that do to a person when they're occupied by the heart and mind of Jesus? Well, it gives them Jesus' thoughts and Jesus' feelings. That's pretty cool. See, that's a game changer. Because all of a sudden we realize, free to everybody, free to everybody, Jew, Gentile, terrible sinner, goody-goody all your life, whatever, free to everybody is the indwelling of God. That's the mystery. Finally, the mystery is Saul. How are you going to make people godly? Abraham wasn't perfect. Noah certainly wasn't. Even Elijah, we're told, was a man with the same passions we have. How are you going to give people the divine way of living, the divine way of thinking? Ah, you yourself are going to infuse yourself into their lives. So the question becomes, for each of us today, do I want to be that connected to God? Do I want his feelings and his mind to so fill me that he and I think and act identically? Or do I want to maintain my independence? Now, your independence is a joke, because even the wicked, in him we what? Live and move and have our being. But still, he does let you make your own decisions and choices, So this in him thing that Paul talks about all the time, read the epistles of Paul again, please. He's constantly talking about being in him, in Christ, in Christ. He's constantly talking about that. What on earth does he mean? Christ in you, Christ in you. He says, I am alive and yet I'm dead, but I'm not dead, I'm alive because Jesus is living in me. Remember Galatians? So that's the whole thing. This is the mystery that Paul learned. Oh. They're going to say, what about all those people who didn't know that? What about all the Christians? I mean, all the believers who died before this great mystery came, came to light. Can they be saved? Yes, because as soon as they understand it, they proved by the lives they lived on this earth. That as soon as they understand it, they're going to want it. So they're going to be resurrected. And they're going to say, yes. Yes. I want nothing but the feelings of Jesus and the mind of Jesus. You say, well, won't we all be the same? Let Jesus in more and more and more and more because he's already good enough. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? So what did he learn when he was in heaven? He learned something the other disciples, even though they spent three years with Jesus, had a hard time learning. They did. And Paul had to actually teach Peter instead of Peter teaching Paul. He learned that there was no hope except this one. 
He says, for this reason, Paul's talking about us now, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that he may grant you in accord with the riches of his, what do you suppose it's going to be? Glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner self. God in you. That's it. Don't say strengthen me so I can fight temptation. No, say God, live in me. He's already strong enough. Why do we want to be so independent? Make me smart. Make me wise. Make me holy. No, I am holy. I am your holiness. We want to be so independent. Yes. Yes, this is his plan. Do we really like it or not? There are many Christians who will reject God's plan because they want some righteousness of their own. I hope none of you are in that category. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts. This is verse 17. Through faith that you will be rooted. What happens when Christ dwells in your heart? That you'll be rooted and grounded in love. In other words, love becomes your only motive. Your only motive. Can you even fathom that? Everything you do is motivated only by love. Divine love. Wow. Rooted and grounded in love, and you may have strength to comprehend with all the holy ones what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that passes all knowledge so that you may be filled with what? All the fullness of God is what he says there. So what was his eternal plan? To make creatures who through sin and self-disgust would decide what they wanted was to be forever infused with divinity. Are you there yet? Are you sure that's what you want? I'm trying. I'm trying. I think that's what I want. But honestly, I don't trust my own heart very much. How about you? I've been a very selfish, very independent person, very self-motivated, very self-guided. I've, I've had a lot of confidence in my own brain, in my own choices, in my own in life decisions. Do I really want the mind of Christ? The fullness of God, he says. The fullness of God. Wow. So he finally ends up this beautiful revelation. Now to him who is able to accomplish, please listen to this in case you ever get discouraged, far more than all that we ever ask or even imagine by the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's how Paul ends that wonderful revelation. There's nothing he cannot do in you. Nothing he cannot do in you. Wow. Thank you, Father, for this beautiful revelation. Thank you that Paul met Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, spent three years with him, and now tells us authoritatively, this is our heritage, to be filled up with the fullness of God ourselves and to be representatives of God forever throughout the universe. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. May we stand for our closing hymn 569, hymn 469.
Dear Father, thank you so much for giving Paul these great revelations, for showing him that indeed you have this marvelous plan for us and you will unite us to yourself if we will allow it. Give us every day the longing to be connected with you all the time, 24-7, to let you in and let your mind and feelings just take over inside of us. We thank you, Father, for this great revelation in Jesus' name. Amen.